session in here is going to focus on infectious diseases. Thankfully, the Ebola crisis was brought under control last year, but then we had the Zika outbreak, which raised fresh questions about global preparedness and the state of readiness for another major outbreak somewhere in the world with the capacity to spread across borders. What lessons have we learned and what are the gaps that still remain? For this panel, I'd like to invite the panelists to join me on stage now. Thank you. I'm delighted to uh, welcome them all. Uh, Dr. Seth Berkeley is the chief executive of the Global Vaccine Alliance, Gavi. Uh, Professor Jun Orna Rottingen is from the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. Sir George Allain is a former UN Special Envoy on HIV AIDS in the Caribbean, and also formerly of the Pan American Health Organization, the regional arm of the WHO. Her Excellency Professor Dr. Nguyen T. Kim Tien is the Minister of Health in Vietnam. And Dame Sally Davies is the Chief Medical Officer for England. And I'm going to ask Dame Sally to begin by giving us an overview of uh, where we are in terms of infectious diseases in the world today. Dame Sally. Thank you, Michelle, and good morning. I want to pick out three diseases just to look at some of the lessons we've learned to prepare the way for a discussion on preparedness and where we should be focusing, and so where better to start than Ebola that was a wake-up call to all of us. We from the UK um, supported Sierra Leone, particularly in this. We spent um, over 400 million pounds building community centers, hospital beds, providing support. What did we learn? Well, we saw that to be successful, we needed partnerships between government and NGOs, that we needed to have a vaccine, yet the vaccines that had got to a certain stage in the early 90s had never gone into humans, so were not ready, really, during this outbreak and this epidemic. We saw that the issues I talked about yesterday of infection prevention and control and public health measures were needed, yet in many countries, as soon as they become overwhelmed by an epidemic, that's one of the first things that falls away. But interestingly, we were not able to support the country to get on top of it until our anthropologists explained the burial practices and how to support the elders of the community to change those burial practices, because you can't order people to. You have to work with their values and their value systems so that they change them to protect their public. And they did, and we got there. But we had no rapid diagnostic tests that we needed. Diagnosis was slow, it was not easy. And even now, there are problems, not of the actual diseases, but for those who are left as survivors. The 50% who survived are actually having a very difficult time. And again, that brings value-based systems and culture into how we face public health challenges. Let me, in this very quick overview, think about Zika. And it was first discovered back in 1947 in, in Africa, but we know that in Brazil in May last year, 2015, the first reported case was seen. It's spread now to over 75 countries. It's carried, as you all know, by a particular mosquito, the Aedes aegypti. And what you can see from this diagram, which highlights the countries it's in, is how difficult it is to stop a mosquito-borne disease outbreak once it enters a naive population, a population that has not seen this before. 
And actually, this reinforces the experience we already had from dengue and chikungunya. And there are some interesting medical interactions between all these diseases. And once these diseases enter a population, these obscure diseases, we see different things. And we all thought that Zika was relatively mild. And of course, it is in most people. But there's an increased incidence of a syndrome called Guillain-Barre. And I was hearing about the cases in Grenada only yesterday evening, which is an ascending paralysis with a death rate associated with it, particularly if you can't get um, ventilation, artificial ventilation early. Um, even more distressing is this high prevalence, apparently, of microcephaly and the brain problems. And we haven't got a vaccine. And it's proving very difficult to control. It's sexually transmitted. And it's difficult to control uh, mosquito-borne diseases, even though countries are trying the Wolbachia-infected ones. The final disease I wanted to pick out is actually that of Middle Eastern respiratory virus. And I thought we'd take the outbreak in South Korea. In May of last year, one gentleman went through four Middle Eastern countries and came back and in infected 185 six people. And he did it through four super spreaders in particular. And it showed how difficult it is if you don't know you've got a new disease, that you then don't isolate people. You over, there was overcrowding in the emergency rooms, inadequate ventilation, family, friends going through. That could happen in any of our countries. And I still remember when we had our first MERS case, how difficult it was because we weren't expecting that diagnosis to get a speedy diagnosis and do what was needed. And do you know that actually the emerging diseases, 75% of them come from animals or insects, but come from other species. This probably shouldn't be surprising. We're encroaching with population rise on their habitats, clearing jungle. So it shouldn't be surprising. But as an international community, if we don't recognize this, develop rapid diagnostics, effective treatments and vaccines, then we're going to have a lot of problems. And this slide here, which is getting towards the end, shows you the last um, few years from 1980, 35 infectious diseases have emerged, approximately one every eight months. Some are new, Ebola, SARS, H1N1 flu. Some re-emerging, cholera, human monkeypox. And don't forget the bioterrorism like anthrax, um, which has happened. And, you know, there are all sorts of ecological reasons. Human demographics and behavior, increased international travel and commerce, let alone climate change and breakdown in public health measures. So, of course, we do have to rediscover our public health and how that goes and how we can build that through it, strengthening international health regulations. We need effective sanitation. How can we get rid of mosquitoes? Therein lies a problem. So, we know that these have devastating impacts on countries when they happen. They know no borders. We clearly need to work together, as our plenary speaker said. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dame Sally. Uh, I'd like to turn to the, to the minister next, because uh, Vietnam is a very interesting country for many reasons. It had a particularly uh, bad time with bird flu uh, more than a decade ago. I wonder if you could begin, Minister, by just telling us about the current situation in your country as far as infectious diseases are concerned. Uh, it, and your microphone is next to you. Yeah. Vietnam, we have uh, 90, uh, 90 million uh, population. And uh, we have had the uh, uh, emerging disease outbreak like uh, SARS more than 10 years ago. 
um, uh, Zika canal and uh, bird flu. And at the same time, we uh, have had uh, we have the circulation of the G mesen disease, such as the dengue hemorrhagic fever, hand foot mouth disease, and uh, drug resistant malaria. So both emerging diseases and re-emerging diseases. You're concerned about both of those. And how are you trying to bring that under control? Uh, we applied uh, all the comprehensive together uh, measure. Uh, the first uh, for the preventing the uh, outbreak from outside into Vietnam, uh, we implemented uh, very strict uh, guarantee at the uh, border of the countries. And we follow the suspected case from their entrance to uh, anti uh, their leaving from Vietnam. And uh, the second uh, measure, we, uh, uh, up, we uh, implemented very close collaboration, international collaboration with neighbor countries, ASEAN countries, and other international organizations uh, for sharing information, sharing and learning experience, uh, as well as uh, sharing uh, sample and specimen of the virus during the outbreak. And for control the inside Vietnam, uh, we apply three uh, comprehensive uh, measures for make the first for making policy, the second technical uh, measure, and the third for the financial measure. Uh, for policy measure, we uh, establish very strong uh, political commitment with uh, establishing the uh, National Steering Committee uh, with the chair of the prime minister and the executive director, that's the uh, uh, minister of health. And uh, we apply the very, uh, uh, very strong and very often the uh, multiple approaching uh, for the in, in inter uh, sector uh, with many ministries, uh, such as the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Communication, Ministry of Transportation, Ministry of the Defense, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, etc., and are very close uh, with the duty of the uh, authority, uh, local authority. And at the same time, we have a very close international collaboration with the uh, WHO, uh, FAO, uh, USAID, uh, CDC, uh, UK, uh, EU, and Zika um, Japan. Mm. Uh, well, on, that, on that note about international collaboration, let me turn to Sir George Alain. And it, it, there's an obvious international role in all of this because these diseases do not, <coughs> do not recognize borders. Um, how, would, how would you say, I mean, the WHO faced a fair amount of criticism in its handling of Ebola. How would you see the role of an international organization in, in, in the instance of a major outbreak? Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm going to take off from where Larry left off. I was absolutely delighted to hear him speak of invent, investment in global goods. Because for an investment in global goods to deal with the problem, such as Sally mentioned and the minister mentioned, we need a global architecture. And I think part of the problem is the lack of appreciation of the nature of the global architecture that is already in place, and how do we make optimal use of that global architecture? The World Health Organization represents the world's health organization. And many of the problems it has encountered is because of a lack of appreciation of what does constitute WHO. WHO is not only Geneva. WHO is represented by a central secretariat, its country offices, and its regional offices. And what WHO has tried to put in place but not adequately funded for is what my friend Julia Frank has mentioned before, global systems to address these global problems. And what are these global systems? At the central level, WHO being responsible for global monitoring, information, resource mobilization, being the absolute voice for informing the world on what is going on. But we forget sometimes that there are other levels of WHO. They're the regional offices, which are responsible for the direct technical cooperation with member countries. And without that technical cooperation, the application of these instruments that are needed for infectious disease control cannot be applied. And Zika is a good example. 
Zika was uh, demonstrated in May in Brazil. By a couple of weeks later, the regional office had mobilized attention, weekly information. In the course of the last couple of months, 58 missions to the countries to alert them yeah. how to deal with Zika. Okay. So the, in sum, we need to appreciate the nature of the international global architecture. And Professor Rottingen, do you think that therefore lessons have been learned from how Ebola and Zika have been handled? Lessons that help us deal with, with uh, other infectious diseases? Yeah, I believe so. Um, and of course, there have been very many systematic evaluations now after Ebola, and I know Ebola outbreak better than, than I, uh, I know the Zika situation currently. Um, but I think what we did demonstrate there was that the world as such was not sufficiently prepared at all these levels, from the local domestic uh, community level through the regional levels to, to the uh, global and international levels. And that's related to both of these two issues. And, and this is a difficult debate, kind of the, how to invest in public health capacities, both at all these three levels, uh, versus how to invest in, in uh, products and technologies that uh, are really necessary. And I think the Ebola outbreak um, demonstrated that we had been insufficiently uh, investing on both those accounts. Um, but it also demonstrated a success uh, related to technology development, uh, because we had no Ebola vaccines tested in humans, at least among the promising candidates before the Ebola outbreak. And, and within less than a year, we managed to conduct more than 15 clinical trials, both in, in Europe, North America, but most importantly so in the affected countries. Um, because, because of the emergency nature of the situation? Because of the emergency nature and, and, it, and because of the close collaboration between public-private sector, close collaboration between uh, the national regulatory authorities, ethics review boards and, and everything. And what we did in, in the Guinea vaccination trial, the ring vaccination trial, was that we more or less demonstrated quite solidly so that there can be an effective vaccine. And we demonstrated that uh, in, in Guinea. So that points back then to the, the global architecture, because we need, on the public health functions, we have a system, and we have an agreed system uh, with WHO in the leadership on the normative side and also on, on coordinating uh, national capacities. But on the global public good side, so actually how to do R&D uh, for producing what we can call biomedical countermeasures, diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines, we really do not have that architecture in place. So in addition to my role at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, I'm currently uh, the interim CEO of a new coalition, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CEPI, which is trying to set up this new architecture, uh, a new coalition that can complement uh, the, the UN bodies that have their role to play, but an organization that can really mobilize both public and private resources to yeah. do the necessary development ahead of time. And Seth Berkeley, it's obvious when, you know, in, in, in that emergency situation, it focuses minds, but really you shouldn't have to wait for the next outbreak in order to get clinical trials, you know, much faster than they happen at present. So a, a couple of points. So, um, you know, vaccines are the most cost-effective intervention in healthcare. Our role at Gavi is to try to get these vaccines, the new ones, out to 60% of the children <clears throat> living in poor countries. Now, that's critical because at the end of the day, vaccines don't deliver themselves. You need to build the systems that deliver them. And when you do that and you build the supply chain, the cold chain, the data systems, that also allows you to be in a position to react when there are pandemics. Now, Sally talked about a number of the other, uh, of the outbreaks that are going on globally. Let me just touch on two others. After Hurricane Matthew, Haiti has had a big outbreak of cholera. We were able to mobilize and bring a million doses of cholera vaccine there, which is now being implemented quickly. On yellow fever, this is a vaccine that from the 1940s, from the Rockefeller Foundation, and yet when we had a big outbreak that started in Angola and then spread to countries, including, by the way, cases in China, where it didn't take off, but where two billion people live in 80s Egypti areas and had it, the world would have been underprepared. We had so little vaccine that we had to go to fractional dosing, dividing one dose into five doses to be able to cover the city of Kinshasa. 
So what we're seeing is a dramatic change now. We have global warming occurring, we have in increasing populations, we have urbanization. With these, our epidemics are changing, and it is evolutionarily certain we will see more of them. So what we need to have is a system to be able to get vaccines out, new ones, both made, as, as Jean Arnaud talked about, but also to make sure those vaccines have a market. They will be purchased, they will be stockpiled, because this will not happen in its own. These countries don't have the drawing power to create the type of marketplace that will drive this innovation in our private system. But meanwhile, Dame Saudi, look, look at the, the big killers. In 2015, uh, half a million people died of malaria. 1.1 million people died of HIV. 1.8 million died of TB. This is all going on, and yet, you know, it, it's when we have something like Ebola or, or Zika that everyone focuses on that. Well, it did, um, because it was an acute emergency that uh, spread so rapidly, and, and there was a security issue. Uh, meanwhile, through the Global Fund, the uh, delivery of retrovirals at affordable prices on HIV has been going up. But at the same time, we've got resistance of the HIV virus. And so what we're having to handle is the ever-increasing burden of malaria, TB, HIV, the resistance in those, and then these emerging or re-emerging diseases. And it does take us exactly to that debate that's, that we've been having this morning about the global goods and how do we support countries, because at the base of prevention has to be public health, which is good sanitation, good hygiene, and good speedy diagnostics, quarantine, and support for pe individuals. So it is, it's all doable, but at the moment it's rather a bitty system, and that I think does take us into the architecture. And I would argue that the regional office in Africa did not support West Africa effectively to start with. We're working from our DFID aid agency with the new regional director in Africa to really change how they respond and support her as she develops her staff and different ways of working. And I believe that if it happened again, the response would be quite different from that regional office of the WHO. Um, Sir George Allen, would you, would you recognize those deficiencies in the, at the regional level? I should never comment that the deficiencies are at the regional level. I can only speak from what I know. Uh, but I'll take off on the point that Sally made. Polio was eradicated in the Americas for the very reason she pointed out, that the annual point of the infrastructure was there to deliver the vaccine. And I think for us in the new dispensation is to build upon what has been done in these other areas. So I would foresee in the future, in Africa, in the other regions of the WHO, building upon what has been learned from the Ebola epidemic in order to meet the new threats. Mm. Um, Seth. Um, a, a couple of points on this. So first of all, there are new tools also for those big diseases. We just uh, uh, had approved moving forward with the first malaria vaccine that now has shown efficacy. The challenge is it has it to be delivered. It about one strain of malaria. I, well, I it's for the common strain that kills people in Africa, so a pretty important strain. Um, not the perfect vaccine, but the question is it has to be given in four doses, three of which are outside of our existing uh, system. And so the question is, is it deliverable in that circumstance? And what will the effect be in the population? So we will see new tools like that. But one point that comes out on this, we talk about the countries that you know, had the disaster about Ebola, what about the countries that didn't? What about places like Mali or Senegal or Nigeria that had cases of Ebola and were able to contain them? What's critical is having local capacity, and local capacity, public health capacity, but also research capacity. And this has been against the development paradigm, which has been, you know, primary health care, primary school education are the key issues. What about having a team of researchers? What about being able to do vaccine trials in your country? And this is something that becomes a critical global public good, because when outbreaks occur, you don't know where they're going to occur. You can't do the research in Oxford 
forward. And Boston, you've got to do it in these countries. And that was one of the problem in the three countries with Ebola. They just didn't have that type of human capacity in place. And this is something that we should see happens going forward. Yeah. Let, let me turn to the minister on that, because it's an interesting point about what countries themselves can and should do in terms of, of vaccines. What, what is your approach in Vietnam? Uh, in Vietnam, uh, we, uh, we implemented EPI program successfully, so, but uh, we have some problem. The first, uh, the re, re emerging some disease prevented by vaccine, for example, currently for the measles. Even we have program for eliminating measles by vaccine, but uh, currently, not only in Vietnam, but even in the United States, there are some emerging of the measles. So even with disease prevented by vaccine, we still have the emerging disease because of the, the problem of the side effect of the, some vaccine. So it prevents the mother to bring the children for the vaccination. The first about the vaccine. And the second, even for our Vietnam country, we used to produce uh, 11 per 12 vaccine in expanded program on immunization by ourselves. And it was lucky. Gavi supply freely, almost freely for Vietnam, vaccine fine one, for prevention of the um, uh, hepatitis, uh, typhoid fever, for five disease. And, but uh, um, up to, uh, after 1917, Gavi stopped for supplying. Mm. So we should produce a biocell vaccine for, for 11 vaccine, and currently we got the uh, NRA, uh, National uh, Regulation uh, Authority from WHO. So we, should, we could produce some vaccine, but we need the international helping for vaccine development. Uh, for the local. Yes. So, so just to, to explain that you know, Vietnam had a certain amount of, of support, but as countries become richer, then they are uh, less qualified or in the end um, do not qualify for that sort of support because um, they're judged able to, to stand on their own feet. I wonder, Professor Rottingen, if you could address that, and I want you to, to do it as well, Seth, before we move on, because you're also working on a new funding mechanism for vaccine development. Would, would, would that address the point that the minister is making about graduated support? No, because uh, what, what we are focusing on are the new vaccines, where we do not have approved vaccines. Uh, so those would be for Ebola, Zika, Nipah, Lassa, Marburg, uh, and, and these epidemic diseases. In addition, of course, that we need continued efforts on the big high burden diseases like malaria, HIV, and TB. Uh, but I think this, this is, these are complex issues, and we need to see, I think the, the introduction by Larry Summers this morning is a good paradigm to see it, because we need, in a way, a long-term perspective of how to get where we want. Um, and that sort of transitioning now with the context of sustainable development goals and also the Addis meeting on financing for development, it is, we are seeing a, a political agreement on transferring more of these responsibilities to domestic uh, sources um, and and com that transition then cannot happen with just taking money away but we need to reallocate those investments so that we can maximize health in all countries uh, and I think that's the combination so I understand the challenges of the transitioning phase now of countries so-called graduating from Gavi and other global funding mechanisms we need to s help them still either through local production, but maybe more importantly so, through pool, pooled procurement mechanisms in the global marketplace to secure that they can still get vaccines at a reasonable price. Okay. Seth, you wouldn't want too much individualized production going on right around yeah. the world? So w what's happened initially is the Gavi model is a little bit of what Larry talked about, which is every country pays something, and that's important to get that domestic finance. 20 cents for the poorest countries per dose of vaccine for very expensive vaccines initially. But the second part that's critical is we work, because we purchase vaccines for 60% of the world's kids, to bring new suppliers in 
and to work to drive prices down. So we've seen a 95 percent reduction in prices. Now, what's critical about bringing new suppliers in is you can't have vaccine producers in every country. The plants are hugely expensive. The quality of vaccines and the complexity of them are getting uh, much harder. So the challenge is, again, to have a global scheme that says not one manufacturer for each vaccine, but not a hundred. Your, your most cost-effective point is going to be have a marketplace of five to seven manufacturers. And for example, the five-in-one vaccine that we now have, you know, we've had now a 70 percent reduction in price from our low starting price. And so we're right now about the point where it's, it's very hard to compete in that space. But that becomes a global public good because that vaccine can be made available to all these countries. And when they graduate from Gavi, initially they would have had to spend 10, 12, 15 percent of their health budget on vaccines, which I think is a good investment, but I can understand why they didn't. But at graduation, it's 0.6 percent they would have to spend for the vaccines on average. And that, of course, is affordable. OK. I want to stop on the vaccine front for just a moment, because I want to look a bit broader. And I want to ask each one of you, and I know this is going to be difficult, but I want to ask each one of you to identify the one disease that you fear the most, either a major outbreak or something that is already going on. And then I want to look at how um, a response to that could be better coordinated or run. So Dame Sally, what do you most fear? <laughs> Well, I've said it yesterday, it's drug-resistant infections. Yeah. I meant a disease. You want me to pick yeah. one. I think at the moment it's TB. Okay. Minister, what do you most fear? Which disease? Um, I think that uh, drugs, uh, malaria. Malaria. Uh, Sir George? Pandemic flu. Okay. Uh, Yoon? So I would say the unknown disease, which will be airborne like SARS and which will transmit uh, highly uh, and which we do not really know today and do not have the capacities to do large kind of scale production for vaccines or other countermeasures. Okay. Uh, I like the unknown, but from what we know, it has to be pandemic flu. Okay, right. So then let's, let's take pandemic flu, because this is always the sort of big worry that, you know, when, if or when will we see um, a, a pandemic flu outbreak? God forbid we had that today. Um, I want to ask each of you, out, you know, out of 10, how red, what is our global state of readiness? So give the, give the world marks out of 10. Three. Three out of 10. Minister, how ready would the world be for a global flu pandemic? Mm. Low. Five, out, five out of ten, something like that? What would you say? How ready would we be? Uh, we think that's maybe vaccine. Okay. Sir so George? Three. Three out of ten. Yoon? Four. Okay. I actually did a TED talk on this. <laughs> Two or three. Wow. And part of it is, is the craziness. We still make the majority of the vaccines in eggs which is yeah. a slow process depending upon the strain, the same technology that's been used for 50 years. Okay, so that is the roadblock as far as you're concerned. I want to ask the others, you know, why? Why is it such a poor state of readiness for something that is talked about year after year and, and well, and in fact, flu is an ongoing annual big killer year after year? So we clearly need a vaccine and you've just heard some of the issues so i won't expand on that but we've just had in the uk a three-day exercise on flu on a pandemic that killed a lot of people and it became absolutely clear that we are one of the countries with great readiness that we could not cope with the excess bodies, for instance, what are we going to do? So we're now developing plans. But if we, who are supposed to be one of the most prepared countries, could, going through an exercise, find a lot of things that need improving, just on the internal bit, add to it the vaccines, and then the increased global traffic that we have, and the lack of solidarity that WHO did pretty well in the 2009 pandemic, but a severe one, and that was mild, will stretch everyone. It becomes very worrying about the deaths, as Larry Summer says. And then what that will do to society as you start to get all of those deaths, we're back to anthropology, 
and then the economic impact. Yes, I mean, lack of solidarity is a very interesting one, Sir George. I wonder if you could um, comment on that, because you can see why in those sorts of scenarios, however much we should help the countries dealing with it, um, you know, the, the tendency would also be to, to effectively put up the walls and protect yourself. I want to introduce a different, slightly different dimension. Uh, nothing will happen unless the health systems in the countries are adequate. And the critical deficiency, which will make it difficult to deal with pandemic flu, is lack of good information systems in the countries. If I had to focus on one thing in which I would devote attention at the moment, is adequate information systems at the country level for early detection of the next pandemic. Okay, and doesn't the, the world we're in with, you know, digital mapping and all the new information tools, doesn't it help us sufficiently on that? No. The technology is fine, but we have to use the technology. And there's been not in place in our country, at the country, in spite of all the technology, the adequate systems for collecting the information. At the, if an epidemic occurs, how do you get the information quickly from that village to a central point to inform WHO? That is one of the major so, blocks. Yeah. So, so it's interesting because you, you talked about the information. We're experimenting right now. We're delivering uh, vaccines by drone in Rwanda mm -hmm. to try to get over some of the logistical problems that exist. But the problem in the wealthy countries is going to be we've moved to a just-in-time delivery system. Mm -hmm. So everything, the drugs, the equipment, if you have now a major, major pandemic, like we're talking about in flu, and you all of a sudden have reductions in flights and reductions in police services and all of the other things, transport, how do you manage in that, in that situation? So in some sense, the isolated places may be better off for a period of time than the uh, kind of global capitals that neither have the equipment available nor are able, you know, the spread would occur so quickly given the amount of global travel that exists. Um, Professor, you said your biggest fear was the unknown threat. How do you or can you prepare for an unknown threat? Also oh, linked to the information because you, um, the, the capacity to share information really relies on the information to be there in the first place at the, at the local clinic. And that information needs to come there through diagnostic capacity or de detection capacity, surveillance capacities in communities and countries. And as a part of that capacity, we need to pick up the new unknown uh, viruses uh, and other pathogens as well. Um, and, and that speaks then to real capacity on the ground. But then linking that to fast track vaccine kind of development and testing uh, abilities. The challenge with influenza today is that it's, it's a highly kind of it's, it's a profitable market. It's, it's a many billion dollars market internationally, but really to prepare for, for a pandemic uh, flu situation, we need to transition that market from a very old fashioned production system. And so in many ways, there is a market transition failure. It's actually how to get from where we are today, which is kind of, it can work for seasonal flu, uh, still not very effective vaccines, but into kind of the longer term needs on, on potentially more long lasting protective vaccines for, yes. for flu, which also can translate into pandemic vaccines. And, and there were no vaccines, I mean, just be factual, during the 2009 outbreak, there were no vaccines that would have gotten to the developing world in time to make a difference had it been a terrible outbreak. Luckily, it turned out to be a relatively mild strain, but with all so the So then talk, we get to the importance of social distancing, proper infection prevention and control control to try and protect people and, and how that plays out. And if you talk about the unknowns, one reason we plan so very carefully for pandemics is if we're ready for a pandemic of flu, then it should stand us in good stead, both nationally and in our partnerships, for the unknowns, because it is about data collection. One of the things we haven't mentioned, which is quite interesting, is how Google can monitor searches and for many countries, they pick up the flu before the public health authorities do. You mean because, because people are searching for coughs, colds, yes. So, and they've published that. So it's quite interesting how big data can inform, um, because of the searches and things, what is going on As out long there. as it feeds through. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But Sorry, in I my just, previous yeah. job, I used to refer to the sick, the sick sequence. Uh, you mentioned before the sick sequence, surveillance, information, communication, 
those are the three that are critical for our preparedness. Okay. Uh, yeah, Minister. I agree with you. Uh, in practical situation in Vietnam, we uh, were the first country to control successful, uh, successfully SARS yes, sure. 10 years SARS. ago, and now with uh, Zika and uh, bird flu. Bird flu in five years ago. Uh, we are, the first step, I think so, and very important, that's communication, open communication. Mm -hmm. I always uh, say with our staff, uh, communication should go ahead. Communication with the international level uh, to supply all the information and communicate with uh, our population to give us some very useful message for prevention. And the third for the mass media and many channel message to support us if we have uh, some uh, crisis or problem of the epidemic, for example, currently for the side effect of vaccine, for the re of measles, and many side effects and problems in medicine. So communication, very important to avoid the uh, health crisis in communication crisis. It's a problem, pro big problem for the manager, uh, for example, Ministry of Health. Mm. And the second, we should uh, call the community participation, very important for prevention. Mm. Now, Zika and dengue hemorrhage fever and chikungunya with the same vector, but not yet having va had vaccine. So community participation uh, of the women union, youth union, uh, school children, and of course authority for participation of the control of the larva and mosquito. Very important for control of the of prevention. Uh, and also we think that we are sharing this international level okay, and want, surveillance system. I want to turn to Professor and then I'll come back to Dame Sally. Yeah, because Sally's talked about social distancing, distancing and, and the challenge in many ways is that if we do not contain, if we do not have the sufficient technologies, we do revert to social distancing, we do revert to quarantines, isolation. And we just heard Larry Summers talking about how the world has become more interdependent, more interconnections. Travel trade is really part of the drivers of our economies. So our interdependence of each other is much stronger, higher today. If kind of due to that we need, and we do not at the same time really boost our investments uh, in technologies, in capacities, so that we do not need to revert to the isolationist sort of uh, paradigms on controlling infectious disease. Uh, I think that it's, it's really important and, and we haven't seen that sufficiently so. Yes. Um, so w one of the amazing things about the developing world now is that they are moving on technology quickly. So we have higher coverage rates, which for example, the first cancer vaccine, which is for liver cancer, we have higher coverage rates in the poorest countries than in the middle income countries. We're now pushing for the second cancer vaccine, which is cervical cancer. It's the largest killer of women, for example, in, in Africa. We are now going to try to push to get that out. And my prediction will be in five or seven years, we'll have better coverage of that in the developing world than exists in the wealthy countries. So, so that lets me pick up on an issue that uh, the minister was raising, which is this about side effects from vaccines. As we know, by the time they come into widespread practice of funded by Gavi, they are very safe, apart from, in some people, some local reaction. But unfortunately, the community does not always accept that. So we have the example of um, the belief that autism can be associated with the measles vaccine. The research is quite clear. It is not associated. And has that not been established quite conclusively some time ago? It has been, and Wakefield was thrown off our UK medical register for what he did and how he did it. But he's funded by families in Florida to go on proselytizing this. And there have been tweets from the president-elect saying that he supports that view. If you take the um, papillomavirus, uh, vaccine, to, which is an infection that causes um, cervical cancer, then there are two countries, developed countries, that have effectively suspended their programs because of a belief that the vaccination is associated with um, rapid heart rates and fit, uh, collapsing 
and fits in teenage which girls. Countries, which countries are those? Japan and Denmark. And yet, there is absolutely no evidence when we go through the data to support that. Okay, so that gives the sense of how the, the sort of mission to educate and explain has to go alongside the development and the scientific development, otherwise there's a limited and, and use. And confidence in international yeah. institutions and expertise and data, because to Sally's point, I mean, the data on autism is so clear and has been looked at over and over because of the continuing rumors, but it doesn't matter because, you know, uh, there's an alternate universe of people who enforce each other, reinforce each other, that this idea is relevant. Okay. Um, I want to just finish by asking each of you for a brief thought on how we would close the gap on what is um, possible to do, whether through the technological resources and the scientific development, and the place which we are at now, where all of you have described a very low state of readiness, at least for another um, a, a big flu pandemic. Um, what would you say, Minister, needs to be done to make your country and the world in a better place to deal with infectious diseases? Uh, thank you for your question. We think that uh, we've, for the technical aspect, we follow the prevention, early de detection, and early response. For prevention, we mentioned already about the communication first and the, um, and, and the uh, prevention with the participation, community participation. But what about for the early detection? The first step we should uh, establish the surveillance system from the uh, central level to the grassroots level in order for early detection. But how technique we can detect earlier, that's uh, about the technical development yeah. for producing the test kit which have uh, sensibility and spe specific uh, enough for early detection and for accurate diagnostic that we need the help of, uh, the helping from the international organization. Normally, we receive the test kits from uh, WHO and CDC in the very urgent situation, uh, such as currently for the Zika in Vietnam. Yeah. We use the test kit for detecting three antigen uh, at the uh, three disease at the same time: dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. So it's very good, it's practical. Okay. Uh, okay, Sir so George, how would you close the gap? There are two things I would do if I had a magic wand. One, I would strengthen the global architecture uh, for the, uh, the surveillance information and communication. And secondly, I would strengthen our capacity for research on global public goods. Um, Seth. So for me, and it's obvious I'll say this, the world has the best immunization coverage it's had in its history. 86% of kids get at least uh, uh, three doses of the basic five-in-one vaccine. If we can get those to every child and build the systems out, then of course that becomes the health system that can be used for information, for epidemics, for other activities. And um, I, would, along with that, would agree with uh, Sir George that we build capacity globally, but also in developing country. Every country needs to have your basic public health capacity, laboratory capacity to be prepared to deal with the unknown that John Arn has said, and it will occur yeah. in different ways in different places. Professor? Yeah, this is a World Innovation Summit for Health, so I think I would focus on innovation capacity, and as Seth mentioned that it's not efficient for all countries to have manufacturing capabilities and actually make vaccines themselves. So we need a division of labor, we need a marketplace on that. When it comes to research and development, we need also to have much stronger collective mechanisms to invest. It doesn't make sense that in, in a space where we really need public and philanthropic investment, that we go each other, no, each alone, and, and try to invest here and there, instead of actually doing it collectively. So okay. that's my main message. Okay, finally, Dame Sally, you said it was doable, but you know, listening to, to all of you, it feels like an absolute mountain to climb. It is, and while I support my colleagues, I would remind us that we do have an international treaty called International Health Regulations. If only everyone could deliver on that, which is about basic public health, it is about data, information, and transparency, and it is about mutual support, then we would be a lot better off. Okay. It's a big if. 
Yes. <laughs> it, yes, well, well, you know, for, for the sake of us all, I, I sincerely hope you're right. Um, thank you all very much. Um, we've talked uh, about, you know, what is needed, that global strategy, the functioning well at the local level, um, the organized networks, and of course, you know, harnessing the, the power of, uh, of, the, of uh, data and technology that we do at least technically have at our disposal today. I'd like to thank my panel all very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.